Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me this afternoon. My name is Jason Ehrlich. I'm in the Kinetics uh, Noise Control Marketing Group. Uh, also uh, moderating today, I have Tim Hamilton from the our home market group, and he'll uh, take care of any questions or chats and interrupt me uh, as needed. If you all have any questions, please feel free as we're going along to type them up, raise your hand, and anything of that of that nature. So we're going to talk about home theater acoustics today, and we really can't start this conversation without talking about some of the uh, myths and education surrounding uh, home theater acoustics. Even as, as, as soon as 10 years ago or so, even Kinetics was guilty of using some of the wrong treatment or too much treatment uh, inside of a space to, to make it sound good. Uh, the other thing we have to combat is some of the, some of the myths out there. Uh, myths like, oh, I'm spending a lot for my speakers and equipment, so what do I need room acoustics for? I'd actually make a, an argument that the more you spend, the more your system is, is capable of producing uh, very subtle sounds uh, that you're only going to hear if you're not hearing the room itself. Uh, in fact, treating the room the wrong way can actually make it worse, which we'll, we'll look at here in a second. So we've got quite a challenge in this industry because people walking down the street understand they got to spend the money on a projector or a television, speakers and equipment. What they don't understand is they really do need to treat the room because there's nothing you can do uh, to fix to fix a room with audio equipment itself. Even those with the built-in equalization can only go so far uh, to correct a room and by its very nature, it's going to tweak the level of one speaker or another, which obviously is going to kind of manipulate what that audio track is supposed to sound like. So we'll begin the discussion talking about reverberation time. It's kind of the, the basic approach to, especially when you're looking at absorption in a space. And then quite simply, it's just the amount of time it takes uh, for room to dissipate 60 seconds. And it's usually written as T60. So if I snap my fingers, how long would it take in this room for that to, to, go, to drop down uh, 60 decibels? And we kind of look at it, you're gonna see a chart like this. This particular one, you have your sound source, they turn it off. Uh, there wasn't enough of a floor to get the whole 60. So what they just merely do is measure how long it took to get 30 and they'll double it or 20 and they'll triple it. Uh, but generally speaking, you're going to see it expressed as, as, as 60, T60. So what does this mean? Well, it means you got to look at the actual space. So we have some data taken from this 16 by 18 foot by 11 foot area. And they went in and added a, a fiberglass absorber into it. Uh, six square feet, as a matter of fact, and they measured the T60 time and came up with two and a half seconds. So if you were in that room and able to hear that, it would sound, you know, quite reverberant, quite, quite a lot of echo. You would not be able to understand uh, anybody who was talking in the soundtrack, for example. They then doubled up the amount of fiberglass in that space, uh, dropped that T60 time down to two and a quarter seconds, roughly. Still not a pleasant environment to be in. Then going to 30 square feet, uh, they did drop it down to 1.77 seconds, which is appropriate for things like a concert hall or a multi-purpose room. Doubling it again to 60, now down to uh, 1.3 seconds, we see you know, commercial movie theaters, choir rooms, things of that nature. And then finally at 120 square feet, we have a T60 time of 0.85, which not quite what you'd wanna see in a classroom. You'd wanna drive that a little bit lower. Uh, but certainly uh, at least respectable as far as being able to understand what people are saying versus that uh, T60 time. So if you look at a theater, and here's some of those uh, myths in education starting, is depending on who you ask, generally speaking, uh, you want a T60 time of a third of a second up to half a second in a home theater. And I think this is a nice illustration if you kind of think about it like this. In a cathedral, you want the, the choir and a pipe organ to have a lot of reverberant sound. You want to be bathed in that, in that sound. You don't have snare drums and things of a sharp nature that are going to uh, disrupt that reverberation time. Whereas if you look at a home theater, if there's a scene in a cathedral, the sound designer is going to add the reverberation. You don't want the room to make the sound. You want the speakers to make the sound. And frankly, this is about where a lot of people, even Cedia, which is the, the industry leader as far as a home theater and smart home integrators, great trade show, by the way. If you ever have a chance to go, you can hear, you know, half a million dollar home theater sound setups with none of the long lines that you get in consumer electronics shows. So the Cedia show, I would recommend it. 
but they have some audio uh, software that they make available. This is where they would stop. What's the T60 time? Well, really in a home theater, you need to look at many, many frequencies. And you can see by this chart, as we go from high frequencies to low frequencies, how those frequencies and those wavelengths interact inside a room is quite different. So it's not enough to just say, what's my T60 time? It's what's my T60 time and at what frequency is it? Matter of fact, even this page doesn't go far enough. If we look at what a lot of uh, the architects that are listening in are probably familiar with the term uh, NRC, uh, that measures this little frequency band right here. Uh, it happens to be roughly equivalent to the vocal range. But if we look at what the human ear is capable of hearing, you're looking at 20 hertz all the way up to 20,000 hertz. And in a home theater, you're going to get even below that. You're going to get 18 hertz where you can't even hear it, but feel it all the way up to even 12, 16,000 hertz on the upper end of things. So if you'll take nothing else away from this, if you think NRC is the end all be all of, of a way to look at a, a panel or how you look at an approach to acoustics, it's good for speech frequencies. It's not good if there's any kind of room where music's involved, auditoriums, home theaters, anything like that. So if we take this and try to build the perfect sounding room, we could say, hey, let's draw, let's try to get this much absorption, the right absorption level from low frequency to high frequency, and let's start building our space. Well, if we're building a home theater in a basement, uh, you're gonna see things like drywall, a concrete block, and believe it or not, it's actually a little bit absorptive, and that absorption happens to be fairly uh, broadband. Uh, next, we're going to look at, you know, seats, curtain, and people. Well, those all happen to be decent little high-frequency absorbers. Uh, as you can see, even especially at 5,000 hertz, quite significant uh, amount of high-frequency absorption. So before we've even added any kind of treatment to that space, you can see up here at 5,000 hertz, we're halfway to where we want to be, right? So if we look at the standard one inch thick fiberglass panel, it happens to have an NRC rating of 0.8. This is a product any manufacturer out there makes. This is, we call it our hard side panel. It's a six pound per cubic foot uh, fiberglass panel. Every manufacturer makes it. Some contractors will even wrap them themselves on a job site. Uh, they're, they're that common. Well, the problem with this particular panel, while it's good for speech frequencies, when we add it to that room, our absorption level is quite unbalanced. And if I was in your office, I would take my Sharpie out and I would draw a line at exactly where this thing crosses that frequency point. We see it 500 hertz. And then sharpen it, I'd scribble and say, we've got not enough absorption here and way too much over here. I then would flip my card back over so you can kind of see that uh, the full range of frequencies that we would hear. I take that Sharpie back out, draw it about where 500 hertz is and then explain that the further we get away from that line, you've got two things happening. One, you're sucking all the high-end treble out of the room, and at the same time, you were left with all this bass. So not only have you eliminated by putting that kind of product in the room anything on the high end, but you've also done double damage by this overpowering it anyway. So you'd actually be better off to use less treatment or maybe even none at all uh, to avoid this phenomenon. So what do you do to fix it? Well, you can make fiberglass panels thicker, but you're almost getting perfect absorption up here in the high frequencies. All you're gonna see is a bit of a low frequency bump, and you've just lost three inches of space, and on both sides of the wall, six inches of space. Luckily, Kinetics being a manufacturer, we don't, we don't this is that common six pound core right here. We can take our press and press out a very high dense layer on the top. And what that does is a couple of different things. That denser, denser layer will reflect some of that high frequency energy back into the room. And anytime you put something dense on top of something less dense, you do tend to get a phenomenon where it absorbs more on the lower end. You can see that a two and an eighth inch Versatune panel has an NRC of 0.8, which is the exact same thing as that hard side panel. Uh, but yet when we look at the absorption profile, you see it's very, very flat across that wide frequency range. So when we take this particular absorptive panel, and put it back into our scenario, you can see it's much more balanced. Now, is it perfect? No, we still have a little bit too much here, and we do have not quite enough down here, and that's why treating a home theater really requires a mix of different products. And if you look at some of the things that Kinetics has available right now, this is that 
uh, Versatune two and eighth inch right here that we looked at. Uh, this is a four inch version of that same product. Uh, I don't know of any product on the market that actually has more absorption across a wider band. Not necessarily something you want for a home theater with plush carpeting and curtains because it is a really good high frequency absorber. Uh, here's one that we're actually currently working on, and you can see this is going to be a great partner with some other panels because it doesn't do much, and then it kind of jumps up there at the, the very end. So we're kind of excited about this product. In fact, we're excited because we've built this lab that's literally 40 feet to the south of where I'm sitting right now. Uh, we built it to ASTM standards as far as room volume goes. Uh, not so much with some of the equipment and, and the ability to keep outside noise in, but as a research lab, we're really, really excited about what this is going to be able to do for us. So now we have a, a kind of a fun discussion about what's a base trap and what's a base absorber, because now we're talking about lower frequencies, and depending on who you talk to, what low is uh, depends. Some of these products, such as these foam products, they really market themselves heavily to st sound studios and to the home theater, but if you go and look at those frequency curves, they don't even have data below 100 hertz. And so what they take, they, so they'll take a standard absorber, throw it in the corner of the room where some of these frequencies tend to propagate and call it a trap. But kinetics, since there is no proper definition between trap and absorber, we are going to try to take over that market space and we are going to define a base absorber as something that has a broad range of frequencies. It's going to be a panel. Base trap, we are working on developing specific products that trap at 20 hertz, 50 hertz, and 80 hertz. You cannot build one that's going to be effective across that low range. It has to do with the wavelength size. You really have to tune these things into very specialized boxes and kind of stack them up exactly where those wavelengths happen to hit uh, the, the, the room itself. So there's a lot that goes into not only the design of these things, how you tune those things, but also have the placement in the specific theater because it is crucial to get those in the right place or they're really not doing any good. So one thing we do to kind of help the conversation, uh, we don't like to put on that consultant hat, but we do recognize that the industry, particularly in the home uh, world, is full of those myths. And we try to uh, do something actually at no charge that we offer, that we will work with uh, any kind of homeowner. If you tell us what your room is made out of drywall carpet, that kind of thing, we will pop it into a computer program. It's, it's, it's fairly basic, uh, but yet gives you an idea to have this you know, kind of acoustic conversation of what's going on. So we put, when we punched in this information, this is what that room happened to look at from a reverberation standpoint from 125 hertz up to 4,000. In a home theater, we tuned this into 0.5 seconds and you can see barely that blue line is actually what it looks like after we've added, in this case, a mix of Versatune and TAD panels. So we got you just about perfect. In fact, we took this many of uh, decibels out of that room of just reverberation sound at these various frequencies. So it sounds really good for, especially for free. Um, here's what it doesn't do though. It doesn't look at actual speaker locations. It doesn't tell you where to put that product. And we've teamed up with a home theater designer to offer uh, that next step, that next step up. And it's going to look at a little bit of a wider frequency range and it's going to look at that location and it's going to look at where you're sitting and offer uh, specific uh, information. And if you take a look at what you get, uh, this would be the, the front cover page of that report. And then the next page, you're going to get this. And this is basically saying this top graph happens to be this seating location and this bottom graph is this seating location. The red line is where the computer says this is where that room is going to be after treatment. That thicker dark blue line is a 3 dB swing about what is perfect for a home theater. And that lighter blue there is another 3 dB. So you got six decibels of separation. And you can see for the most part, this particular room that we were able to get that red line pretty much just about where perfection says it should be. Uh, the next analysis you get is very similar to what we offer on, on our report where you get, here's what that room looks like before it was treated. Here's what it looks like after, and it's just a reverberation time uh, that we've talked about. And here you can kind of see where those sound waves propagate. It's picking up where those speakers are, front and rear, and then also where the people are. So you can see it's really kind of balanced where the seating locations is, and that's what's going to kind of draw where you put some of this treatment. 
So the next thing is kind of, a, are we all on the same page? Here's your seating locations, uh, where these things are, dimensions of the room. Do we all agree that this is, this is what your room looks like? The next step is here is the ceiling and here's the kind of the power of what illumination gives you in that you can see this happens to be our TAD uh, panel product and this is that Versatune product. And it's really based on where those speakers are and where you're sitting and where how those sound waves are gonna reflect off uh, the, in this case, the ceiling. Uh, here we look at the right wall. Here is the left wall. And there's the front screen, which you won't need too much because now you're just trying to dig back whatever doesn't come back from this rear wall, which is going to be a good bit of treatment on it. Um, and in the end, you wind up at the, here, this last page, a nice uh, bill of material that gives you not only uh, the size of the panels, uh, but the thickness and the quantities as well as you know just kind of a breakdown base very specifically uh, on your particular room so we go back and kind of look at what this gives you it sounds like it's a pretty complete package what this doesn't do however is that base management again kind of going back to what i mentioned you've got to look at where that subwoofer is sitting and then where is that giant 55 foot long 20 hertz wave hitting people because it's gonna, that's where you're gonna have to place your treatment, and that is that next level. In fact, uh, there is one uh, home theater designer out there on the West Coast, he's got a program set up that looks at 2,500 different ways these sound, low frequency sound can propagate itself into a room, and then kind of just, just fine tune it exactly where everything should be. Uh, I'm, there was one project we worked on over in Scandinavia, where the entire basement was being turned into a home theater. I mean, and when I say the whole basement, I mean, you had a video game arcade, you had a concession stand, uh, you had the whole nine yards. Just the design, just the paper for that particular project was $800,000. And I'm happy to say that Kinetics did have products that were able to be put into that uh, particular uh, home theater, uh, made the cut on that kind of a, of a level. So I'm going to uh, keep it to 20 minutes as I promised. Uh, here is the contact information. Uh, please get your questions handy. We have literally just scratched the surface. We haven't talked about diffusion. We haven't talked about a lot of things. We haven't talked about the noise control aspects of a home theater acoustics. But for this round, we just wanted to kind of give you a taste, especially more on that absorption side of things of what you need to be concerned with uh, when at least first approaching a home theater. And again, especially if you're an architect listening in. NRC is great for uh, for handling new and voice, uh, not so great necessarily for music. I wanna make sure that's a, that's a takeaway from this. So thank you everybody for listening in. Uh, we will now take a look for any questions. And uh, if you do have one later, you should be able to use the email you got, respond to that. We'll be able to pick it up and answer them then. Thank you. All right, looks like a question came in. Let me see if I can find it here. Oh, my screen doesn't want to open up. Give me a second. <laughs> All right, good info, lots of 
through the question is whether 20 hertz wave is actually propagating in a typical room too big a wavelength yeah uh, you do have to kind of look at how that thing kind of wants to pop in in fact when i'm talking to uh, architects during my just normal aia presentation i use that as a good example of of why in a home theater you have a left and a right but only one subwoofer it's because your head can be kind of sitting inside that wave and not knowing where, where uh, what direction it's coming from um, that's the kind of that quick trick if you can't hear that sub right where you're sitting sometimes just hitting that phase button will kind of flip that wavelength a little bit and then seating it inside your head but uh, good good question uh, because it does that that is the tricky part um, to any kind of uh, home theater audio design and one that frankly we would lean on outside experts uh, to make sure we get that right thank you Well, if there is nobody else, thank you once again for sitting in today. And if you do come up with a question, uh, you can, uh, again, contact us through the links that got you here uh, as an invite uh, today. Thank you.